So I know that you have already learned about the real numbers, but I wonder how much you remember. If I ask you right now for the definition of an integer, does anybody know it? Integer. Can you tell me exactly what that the definition is? I'm not surprised that I don't have a whole bunch of volunteers on this one. Nobody ever seems to remember it, right? A whole and number. Oh, say it again. A whole number. You're close. If it's a whole number, though, then it would just be a whole number. So what's the difference between the whole number and the integers? They're not the same. There is a, there is a change. So here's the problem with these, because they're all kind of like swimming around in your head, but nobody can ever remember which one's which exactly. And it's a little weird, right? So I'm going to try and um, I'm just reading in the chat. Any number not as a decimal or fraction? Um, gosh, could you say that? Well, what about like square root of 12? Would that work or would that not work? I don't know. So what I want to do today is I kind of want to, first I'm going to make a, a sort of a diagram to sort of sum everything up. And then we're going to kind of get into the details of who counts as which of the types, right? So what I want to do first is make this big box. And this box represents all the numbers that we refer to as real numbers. So every real number that you can think of can fit in this box somewhere. These are all the real numbers. And this is just a side note, but did you know that there are numbers that are not real numbers? Isn't that weird? I know what you're thinking. Well, what could they possibly be called? Imaginary numbers? Yes, there actually are imaginary numbers. Super weird, right? But they exist. It, it is a real thing. So imaginary things are real. Funny, right? Um, you don't have to worry about imaginary numbers until Algebra 2. So I'm going to let that teacher sort of um, get into the weeds with you on that. However, I will tell you, because uh, I know you're probably like, well, what could it be? What does anybody know? Can you give me an example of an imaginary number? I'll tell you, but I'm just curious if you know it. Am I no one? No, that's okay. I'll tell you. So square root of nine is three, right? Right? But what's the square root of negative nine? I know you might think at first, well, it's just negative three, isn't it? No. Because negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. So what in the world is the square root of negative 9? <gasps> it's not. Because 3 times 3 is 9. I need two numbers that I multiply together to get negative 9. It doesn't exist in the real number system. There is a number, believe it or not, that when I multiply it by itself, I do get negative 9. But it's in a whole different set of numbers called the imaginary numbers. So that's what they are. It's square roots of negative numbers. Okay. But again, you don't have to worry about that until algebra two. I just want you to know that, yes, it exists. So when this comes up uh, on a Jeopardy question later today, you'll get it right. All right. Let's try this. So the real numbers, the ones that we are concerned about right now, they are broken up into two parts. Okay, you could have either rational numbers or you could have irrational numbers. A number can't be both. It's one or the other. There's no overlap. It's either going to be rational or it's going to be irrational. Cannot be both. All right, before we get into rational. Excuse me. I want to talk about the irrational. So I'm going to start with them. Because I know you know an irrational number. Shout it out. Anybody? 
And in order to shout, you have to make noise come out of your mouth. <laughs> What's everybody's favorite irrational number? It's associated with a delicious dessert. Yes, I got it in the chat. Pie, pie, yes, pie. Point one four. Yes, three point one four. One five nine, and then two, blah blah two, blah. Two six five three five eight nine. Wow, I only know this much. That's as far as I go. But here's what makes pi irrational. It's irrational because it never ends. So see those dots at the end? They're important. That means that it, this number keeps going. And you'll notice that these numbers are not repeating. So I can't use, remember that bar notation? If you had like 0.3 repeating, then you just put the bar over the three. So that's when I have a repeating decimal. It's the same digit again and again and again and again and again, or the same two digits, like three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four. I don't have that here. These no digits aren't repeating. So I just have this mess. I want you to associate irrational with chaos, okay? It's chaotic. There's a lot going on. It's never ending. There's no sense of order here. It's chaos, right? So that's kind of what's going on here. We have decimals that never end and never repeat. So I'm just going to add that in. Decimal that never ends and never repeats. Okay, pi is not the only one. Of course not. There's tons of decimals that never end and never repeat. And a whole other subset of these uh, that sometimes we overlook are all the weird square roots. So like square root of five, for example, you probably don't know what that is off the top of your head. I certainly don't. I have no idea what the square root of five is. I can approximate it, but it's not like when I say square root of nine, you know it's three. When I say square root of 25, you know it's 5. Square root of 100, you know it's 10. When I give you a weird square root that you have to stop and say, oh, what is it again? Uh, or I think I need a calculator for that. Those are the irrational ones. And I think my camera froze. Ugh. So any time you take a square root of a non-perfect square, that's what everything else is called non-perfect squares. So I'll just add a few. Square root of 10, square root of 20 even. Come back in. All right, any odd, you know, weird square root, square root of 17. All of these are going to be irrationals. Okay. Um, there's plenty, like, you could literally make up irrational numbers, too. So you could say something like negative uh, 6.214097 dot, dot, dot. If you're going to make up your own, just make sure it's got the dots at the end and that you didn't do a repeating pattern in here. And now there it is. You just created an irrational number. There you go. So cool. So this is really the only requirement to be irrational. It's got to be a decimal that never ends and never repeats. So if it doesn't fall into this pattern, these do that, by the way, right? If you actually do this on a calculator, check it out. Here's the square root of 10 on my calculator, right? It's just some crazy decimal. And I know it looks like it ends, but it really doesn't. You got to think about, I mean, it is a calculator. It has limitations. There's only so many digits that can fit on the screen. So if it just kept going, it would literally just be, you know, spitting out numbers for the rest of its battery life until it dies. So they do just sort of, I wish that they, I don't know why it doesn't like add dot, dot, dot to the end. Why not? I feel like they could do that, but they don't. I've never seen a calculator that does it. Maybe there are some, but I'm, I'm not aware of any. So even my graphing calculator doesn't do it. It just, it does so many digits and then it just cuts it off. But knowing that, so just keep in your mind, remember that, oh yeah, it's not really ending. They just show me so many digits. But notice I also don't see a repeating pattern. I don't have, yeah, I got two sevens there, but I don't have seven, 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 seven forever. 
right? So I don't have a repeating pattern here, square root of 10. It turns out to be a decimal that doesn't end and doesn't repeat. So that's why even if I see it as a square root, if I were to convert it to a decimal, I would be right here. I'd have that decimal that doesn't end, doesn't repeat. Okay, so that's all I need to be irrational. If it doesn't fit this, it's automatically this. So sometimes I like to determine if a number is irrational first, because if it's not that, I know to come over here. And there's sort of a lot more things to sort of check off over here. So sometimes it's easier to just rule out irrational first, and then you just know that you're right. So let's start um, adding to this list over here. The rationals, we already said, include the nice square roots. Square root of four, square root of nine, square root of 16, 25, right? All your nice square roots. Or perfect squares, right? Square roots of perfect squares all would fit in there. Now, also in the list of rational numbers, we're going to have a whole bunch of subsets. So I want to start with the smallest subset that we're going to talk about, which is the natural numbers. So I'm going to put them in a bubble down here. Natural numbers. These are the ones that are your counting numbers. So when I go to count, you know, how many apples I bought at the store, I count at one. One, two, three apples I bought, okay? Notice I didn't start at zero. It starts at one. But then it goes on forever. So hold, they are, I mean, I, I almost misspoke there. You'll see I have no decimals, no fractions, nothing weird, just starting at one, and then I add on two, three, four, five, six, and so on forever. The whole numbers are the next level up that include everything in the natural numbers plus one more thing. Does anybody know what the one more thing is that the whole numbers have that the natural numbers don't? Just unmute yourself and tell me or shout it out in the class. What do the whole numbers have? Anybody know? There's one difference between naturals and wholes. No? Wow, you guys are not chatty today. It's just the number zero. That's it. Literally, whole numbers and natural numbers are the exact same thing. It's just that whole numbers also include zero. That's all. So they're starting at zero and going on forever. Kudos to Hannah. She, she texted that uh, just before. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't even see it. Yes, the whole numbers have zero. And now we get to our favorites, the integers that I asked you about earlier. Integers... Now, well, actually, let me back up. See how I'm drawing this? I'm drawing it this way for a reason. So the whole number bubble includes the natural number bubble. So that means anything that is a natural number is automatically a whole number. And notice both bubbles are inside the rational. It's not a bubble. It's more of a box. But anything that's inside this box counts as a rational number. So that includes these guys. Anything in the whole big box counts as a real number. So all of these things are real numbers. They're just split into two groups, either rational or irrational, and they don't overlap. Okay, but everything here is going to be a real number. But any hoosers, I have one more layer, which is the integers. And what do the integers have that the whole numbers don't? What's different? What am I adding in for the integers? Sit negatives. Yes, this is where the negatives come in. 
So I'm still not touching any decimals yet. I'm only adding in negatives now. So this is the first time that we're going to go on forever in both directions here. So I like to think about natural numbers as like a ray. They start at one and they go forever in one direction. Whole numbers, same thing. They're just starting at zero and they go on forever in one direction. Integers is the first time that you have a line. It goes on forever in both directions, right? And that's the only difference. So integers, I know they like, I know you know all of these somewhere in the back of your head, but sometimes it's hard to remember. Okay, well, which one goes with which? Who's the one that does what? That's it. So just try and remember that the natural numbers are what comes naturally. What do you, you know, when you're, when you're one, two years old, what are you learning? And you're learning to count. These are the numbers. Right? Kids don't usually start by learning zero, one, two, three. We start by naturally teaching them one, two, three, four, five, blah, blah, blah. Then eventually they add on zero. Right? After a whole bunch of time passes, we add on zero. Then, you know, things just get really crazy when they get older and then they learn about negative numbers. I actually remember when I learned that negative numbers existed. That should have been a, a giant flag. I didn't know I was going to be a math teacher until I became a math teacher. I was not that person that like grew up knowing what I wanted to be. If you are, I'm jealous because I didn't know, right? I had no idea. It's just, I'm glad that it kind of worked out this way, but I, my undergraduate degree is in biology. If I had known that I was so into math. I mean, I knew I liked math, but why didn't I pursue it? I don't know. Because I was young and dumb. If I could turn back time, I tell you. So anyway, I, I should have realized when I got so excited that I found out negative numbers existed that maybe this should have been an avenue to pursue. But anyway, um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, negative numbers. So integers, now you have your negatives. Now, I haven't even talked about fractions. Where do they go in all of this? Where do fractions land? And by now, like one-fourth, where would one-fourth go? Well, remember what I said before. If you're trying to determine... You got to start by determining if it's rational or irrational. One fourth, is that a decimal that never ends and never repeats? No. So now I know, okay, well, it's somewhere in this box. It's somewhere in the rational numbers. It's not this, it's not this, it's not this. So it just belongs in the general collection of rational numbers. Okay. So in addition to nice square roots, I'm also going to have fractions. So one fourth, I could even do one third, but think about this. What's one third as a decimal? Isn't it just 0 0.3 repeating? <gasps> you see that? So rationals is where I can finally add in fractions and repeating decimals. So I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna break this all out, but I think it's helpful to just have this one sort of Venn diagram snapshot for you to refer back to for a quick reference. Oh, yes. Hannah says for one fourth, it is rational because, yeah, if you turn into a decimal, it's just 0.25. And that's a decimal that ends. Just 0.25. Nice and easy. All right. So let's sort of, um, I'm going to give you the official definition for a rational number. I think it's important for you to see it and have it, even though I think it's so wordy. Um, but I, I want you to see it so that when you encounter these things in the future, there's some familiarity already. So anyway, rational numbers. Let's try this. Let me scroll down here. All righty. Rational numbers.
I don't know if you noticed, but I got new pens. I have a whole assortment now. So excited. I hope that they last a long time. So what are rational numbers? These are all numbers that can be written as a fraction where numerator and denominator are both integers. Okay, what? Right, all numbers that can be written as a fraction where numerator and denominator are both integers. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little, another, another, like I'm not even kidding when I tell you that I have this memory. I remember being in school, another red flag, you know, well, not a red flag, because that's a warning, another huge sign that I should have looked into math teaching a lot earlier than I did. But anyway, I remember learning about these numbers, rationals, irrationals, blah, blah, blah. I knew that pi was an irrational number. I remember learning this definition, but I only remembered the first part of it, all numbers that can be written as a fraction. And I stopped there. So let me cover this part up. If I just said that, all numbers that can be written as a fraction, right? So in my head, that's all I remembered. And I struggled for so long because I was like, okay, well, pi, I know is irrational. I know it is. But I can write pi as a fraction. I can just write pi over one. That's a fraction. So how is that not a rational number? Right? So I was super confused. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I can write pi as a fraction. It's because I did not realize that there was more to the definition. This, this is what makes what I was thinking not work. You can't just write pi over one. Why? Because you need numerator denominator. So top and bottom of your fraction have to be integers. And remember what an integer is. It's just a positive or negative whole number. So pi doesn't fit into that. So you can't just do pi over one. That would not count as a rational number, okay? So I need top and bottom to be whole numbers or negative whole numbers, and that's what makes up the integers. Does that make sense? I hope. So what I wanna do is I just want to make a list of every type of number that can be a rational number. So if it has one of these characteristics, you know it's rational, okay? So, in order to be a rational number, a number must have one of the following, or must be one of the following, I should say. Must be one of the following. So the first thing it could be is a number with no decimal. So I'm talking like 17, 49, 102, negative 70, all these numbers have no decimals. They're automatically rational, okay? So that's an option. Or you could be uh, a decimal that ends. A decimal that ends. Who knows the other word for this? What's another word? Uh, we have a vocab word that means a decimal that ends. It's called a blank decimal. Starts with a T. Yes, terminating. Good. Terminating decimal. 
So um, I use these pretty interchangeably. So I might say decimal that ends, I might say terminating, they mean the exact same thing. So if I have a decimal that ends or terminates, it's automatically a rational number. Okay, so that's another option. Another thing that I could have, um, I could have a repeating decimal. A decimal that repeats. Or, if it's not one of these three things, it could be, um, we already said a fraction. Of course, with integers. We already went over that. You got to have integers on top and bottom. And the last thing I'm going to add to this list is to be a square root of a perfect square. All right, so if I'm going to say that any number is rational, it has to be fall into one of these five categories. It either is just a normal number that has no decimal, nothing weird. If it does have a decimal, that decimal has to end or repeat. If it's not either of those, then I have to have a fraction that has integers on top and bottom. And the last possibility is square root of a perfect square. All of these are going to give me numbers that are rational. And if it's not any of these, it's probably going to be an irrational number that just simply never ends, never repeats. Okay, I do want to talk um, just briefly about um, repeating decimals. So I do kind of want to, sometimes there's a little confusion about who is actually a repeating decimal and who's not. So I need to flip the page. So I'll give you just a second if there's anything here that you need to grab. But don't forget that the notes are always posted for you. So and there are also reference sheets for you. Oh, yes. I know I said it in the other class, but I, I, it is such a... It's like alphabet soup, who I told what to, right? Yes, guys, please make sure that you are checking out the reference sheet folder. Mrs. Muska has done an amazing job of making reference sheets really for each section so far. So, and they're so nice and so concise. And uh, so please make sure that you're checking there. And you can use them on anything, any, all fast fives, quizzes, tests, homework, whatever. I encourage you to use it on the homework, especially because then you know what's there, right? And you're used to using those sheets. So they're always there. They're never, they're not going anywhere. So use them. All right, let me flip this and we'll talk about repeating decimals real quick. Okay, so in order to repeat, or in order to be a repeating decimal, let's say that. The same digits need to appear um, I'm going to say how did I phrase it before? It was pretty good. I'll say in the same block over and over. So you could use bar notation. So if you can write a number with bar notation, then you know it's a repeating decimal. If you can't, then there's no way it could be repeating. So I'm gonna just do some examples of some that are and some that aren't. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, let's start off with repeating. So you could start with your most simple, just your a single digit repeating itself. I could definitely rewrite that with bar notation, right? As just 0 0.7 with the bar over top. So that definitely counts as a repeating decimal. Okay, so that would be rational. You could also, sometimes it doesn't start with the first digit. So sometimes you might say so, something like this, like that. So here, it doesn't matter if it doesn't start with the very first digit, as long as it eventually falls into a never ending pattern of the same number or block of numbers. So this I can write with bar notation. It would just be 0 0.123 and then I put the bar over the three. Okay, and then as you know, I could have more than one digit that repeats. I could have something like four, nine, seven, six, seven, six, seven, six. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's not a six at all. I meant it for it to be, but. It's standing on its head. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. That looks better. Okay, so this one eventually, even though it's two digits, it doesn't matter. It falls into a pattern that doesn't change and it goes forever. So I can still write this with the bar, 0. 0.49, and then I would just put the bar over the seven and the six. Okay, so notice all of these I can rewrite with that bar notation. So they are all repeating decimals. Now, non-repeating, um, besides the obvious, right? You, they might try and trick you with things like this. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, dot, dot, dot. That is not technically a repeating number. There's a pattern that I noticed, sure, but you can't rewrite this with bar notation. How could I? What are you going to put? You can't, <laughs> right? There's, if you tried one, two, it'd have to be one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and it's not. So I don't have this, you know, there's, this is not a repeating decimal here. So it's changing. It's not the same block of numbers. Another way they'll try and trick you, and I know that this uh, comes up on the homework, something like this. What if I did eight, seven, eight, seven, seven, eight, seven, seven, seven. Let's throw on one more eight. So even though these are the same numbers, it's not the same block of numbers, right? It's not eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven. So I can't rewrite this in bar notation. So this is technically a non or not repeating decimal. Okay, so be careful. That one comes up a lot. Kids, uh, you just, you feel like you want this one to be repeating, but it really isn't. There's a pattern, sure, but it is not technically a repeating decimal. So just be careful with that. All right. How are we doing? Does anybody have any questions right now? Are you all still with me? Were you all here to begin with? I'm just doing a quick scan here. I'm alive. Oh, good. Oh, Hannah. Is, is, is that your, um, I feel like your, your uh, headboard is so pretty. Is that your headboard? I don't know. I saw a quick glimpse. There was something that looked like a, looks so nice. Whatever it is, I think it's very nice back there. Any hoosers? Matthew? Maybe, maybe we need to do roll call every now and then. <laughs> I think so. Sure oh, there's that. Yeah. I was just going to comment on how lovely your fan is, but there you are. Okay. Oh, boy. Katrin, are you there? I just see your seat. Oh, yeah, there you are. Kind of. <gasps> Hannah, that is a headboard, isn't it? It's so nice. Okay. All right. Anyway, so I'm ready to talk about irrational numbers. Are you? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. 
Let's get right to it then. Irrationals. This is much shorter because you know that irrational numbers they only have there's really only two things that they could be. So let's just say must be decimals that never end, never repeat. Notice it has to be both. It has to never end and never repeat, not one or the other. I need both. Um, or the only other way that you're going to see irrational numbers sort of appear besides this is to be a square root of a non-perfect square. Okay, which really these are these, right? So if I think of square roots of non-perfect squares, that's like your square root of 10, square root of uh, 28, square root of 50, like all these numbers that I don't immediately know the answer to that I would have to pull out a calculator and see. In fact, take a look. So there is the square root of 10, right? Oh, we already talked about this, right? And I already said, right, we did in this class, right? Yeah, there's only so many digits. So there we have it. All right. So does anybody have any questions with the numbers? That's pretty much it. So it's either got to be rational or irrational. And then I might just have to look at us. Oh. I have my rationals that are broken up into their smaller subsets. So natural, the numbers you naturally learn when you're a baby, one, two, three, four, and so on. Whole, a whole bunch of time passes and then you learn about zero. And then a whole lot more time passes and now you have integers. Now things can go negative. But that's okay, because you're all rational. <laughs> all right, so I have to flip the page. We are going to talk about, um, I'm going to give you a number line, and we're going to find the distances on this number line, and we'll be almost done. Okay, let's flip. I'm going to draw for you just a normal number line here. Let's see. I'm just going to highlight a few points on here. Let's say here's point A, here's point B, maybe here's point C, D, E, F, and we'll put G right there. Okay, great. I have a whole bunch of points on this number line. All righty. Now, we are going to be talking about the distance between two points on a number line. So if I wanted to talk about, let's just say from A to G, right? So if I wanted to talk about this distance from A to G, another way to think about that is the, as thinking about it as the length of segment AG. So I have two definite endpoints. I'm going from A to G. So the length of the segment AG is the same thing as the distance between A and G. They're exactly the same. And now when you talk about distance or length, right, we talk about things in terms of positive numbers. If I ask you how far away from Tantasqua you live, you might say three miles or whatever it is, right? But you never say negative three miles. Even if you live three miles north and Susie lives three miles south, you're both going to say three miles. No one says negative three miles away, right? We don't do that because when we're talking, when we're speaking about distances and lengths, we always refer to them 
as positive numbers. Interesting, right? So even though two people live completely opposite directions, they would still say three miles. And so how do we compensate for, like, what if I wanted to find the distance between A and B? They're both negative numbers. But I know that this distance should be positive because when I talk about distance or length, I talk about it as a positive. So how am I supposed to express this when the numbers here are negative? Luckily, we don't have to think about any of that stuff. There's a very simple thing that we do to find the length or the distance between any two points. It's very easy. We're just going to pop it in our little, uh, I don't know, formula, I guess you could say. And then it's just going to spit out the definition or the, the distance for me. So check this out. To find the distance between two points, just subtract the endpoints and take their absolute value. I should say take the absolute value. That's it. The absolute value part is the part that guarantees us a positive value for our answer. So that's why it doesn't matter if you measure the distance from your house to the school or from the school to your house, right? It shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter who's the first point and who's the second point. As long as I have my two points and I'm going to subtract them, and then take the absolute value. Because I'm taking the absolute value, I don't care about who's first and who's second. It doesn't matter. All right, so let's see how this works with um, a number line like this. So let's just say I wanted to um, find the length of, oh, let's pick a good one. How about, uh, how about AG? Why not? So to do this, according to what we just said here, I'm going to subtract the endpoints and then take their absolute value. So when we write this, it's going to look like this. I'm going to put my absolute value bars, but then I want to do the subtraction inside there. Remember the absolute value bars really act as parentheses. So you have to do the math inside first, and then the last thing you do is the absolute value. Okay, don't do it until the very end. So watch how this works. I'm going to subtract the two endpoints. So A is at negative 2. So watch this. I write negative 2, and then I put a minus. I'm always going to minus after that first number. And then I look and I see, where's G? Oh, G is at 2. So now I'm just going to put in a 2. Now all I have to do is the math. Remember what I said, don't touch the absolute values yet. Don't touch them. Stop, don't touch. Just do the inside. Just do the negative two minus two. You start there, you have to work from the inside out. So what is negative two minus two? Anybody shout it out. Negative two minus two is? Negative four. Yes, thank you. And now my last thing, now I do the square root. And obviously the square root of negative four is just positive four. So that makes sense. And yes, if I look at my original number line, yes, okay. You mean the absolute value, not the square root, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't realize I said square root. Absolutely, absolute value is what I mean. Yes, yeah, so the absolute value of negative four is positive four. That's what we're looking for, okay? So my answer for any time I'm finding length or distance should always be a positive number in the end. So if this isn't coming out positive, something is wrong somewhere along the way, all right? And if I look, it does make sense. Look, I was at negative two and I got all the way to positive two. So how do you do that? We well, have to add two just to get to zero and then I gotta add two more. So yes, getting to four makes sense. I will tell you this right now. 
there will be some of you that are going to try and just count the spaces. You can't do that. It's not because it, each space is not one unit. So please don't get into that. It, make, it gets really messy, especially what happens if I start adding like quarter points. It gets to be a disaster. Please don't try. It's very simple to just, if you have this one way and you're good at this one way and it works for all of them, you're just going to take the two endpoints, subtract, absolute value. You don't have to think about, well, what's my scale here? How many should I be counting by? Just subtract. Subtract, absolute value. Done. Easy. Let's try another one. Um, let's do... Uh, how about, let's do one that's positive, one's negative. How about B, let's do BG. BG. Okay, let me zoom out a tiny bit, see if I can get everything in at once. All right, BG. So I start, I look, I'm looking, okay, B. B, where's B? Someone tell me what the, where's B? What's that coordinate? Where's B? Anybody? I got B the cops. Oh. Negative one and a half. You are right. Negative one and a half. Thank you. So I put my first coordinate and then look, I always write a minus sign. Always. And now I look, where's G? Oh, G is at two. And now I'm doing the math. So negative five minus two, they're both negative. So you're really adding them together, right? So you get a negative 3.5, and then I just have to take that absolute value. So I get a positive 3.5, which makes sense. I knew it should be positive in the end. That's great. Now I'm going to try and trick you. You ready? What if I wanted to find, let's do, um, let's do AC. You would set it up as negative two minus negative one half, which would just be minus a half. And then when you put that together, you get negative two and a half, and the absolute value of negative two and a half is two and a half. So you're. You're right this far, and then you had an error in there. It becomes a uh, positive because then you, yeah, it becomes a positive, so it just becomes the answer is one and a half. Yes. Okay. So take a look, everybody. I had negative two, and then you always put a minus. It just so happens that C is at negative one half. Look, look back up here. Look where C is. Isn't C at negative one half, right? Here's zero, here's negative one. So I'm halfway in between. That's negative one half. So when I put in C at negative one half, that's exactly what it looks like. I write negative two minus negative one half. You know from algebra, when you see minus a negative, what is that really? It turns into plus the positive. So I'm also going to rewrite it instead of a half. I'm just going to do it as 0.5 because it's just easier. And now I'm ready to do my math. So negative 2 plus a positive 0.5. Exactly. We're going to get negative 1.5 there. And now the last step is to just take that absolute value. But luckily, absolute value is nice and easy. So once I have negative 1.5, I just take that absolute value to get the positive 1.5. Wow. All right. So be careful. Watch your signs. Watch them. Minus a negative has to turn into plus. Okay. So I have two word problems that I want to do with you real quick, and then we are done. All right. So let me do the one. Let's see. Your house is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So I'm just using nice numbers. My house is way colder than that, but let's assume we have it set at 70 degrees for nice, easy numbers. Your house is 70 degrees. You want to heat the oven up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe you're going to bake a cake or something. I don't know. 300 is kind of low, but whatever. Anyway, you want to heat up the oven to 300. I want to know how many degrees must the oven heat up? I don't know how much um, how much of an experience you have, but I'll tell you right now though the answer is not 300. If you go to your oven right now and you open it, it's not at zero degrees Fahrenheit. That would be a freezer, right? So what is, the, right, yeah, right now, if your house is 70 degrees, that means if the oven's off, it's just at room temperature, right? So it's already at 70. It's not starting at zero. We're starting at 70, but we need to get up to 300. So you can actually do this problem. I mean, I know this one, you probably already know the answer in your head, but because um, they could get trickier, right? You can solve this the exact same way, thinking about it as the distance between two points. Here's my first point, I'll call it A. Here's my second point, I'm gonna call it B. And all I have to do to find these distances is subtract the two values and take the absolute value. That's it, I'm doing the same thing I did on the number line. And this is a word problem. Weird, right? But it all works the exact same way. So if I just go ahead and set up my absolute value bars, take my first point, which is 70, minus my next point is 300. Again, it doesn't matter who you call the first point, who you call the second, it doesn't matter. Because I'm going to take the, the absolute value anyway. So if I subtract these two, I get the absolute value of what? Negative 230. And then the last thing I do is take the absolute value of that that's how I end up with a positive 230. So that means my oven only has to eat, heat up 230 degrees. It doesn't have to heat up 300 degrees because it's not starting at zero. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So I wanna do one more example that has some negatives in it. And then I'll uh, show you the homework real quick. You are playing Jeopardy, one of my favorite games. If you are unfamiliar with Jeopardy, if you get a question wrong, you can lose points and you can go negative. So right now your score is negative 2000. Maybe you're not doing so good <laughs> to win you need 5,000 points. Well, hold on. You need a score of 5,000 points. That's what I mean. You need a score of 5,000. So my question is, how many points must you earn? Shout out the answer once you get it. 7,000. That's it, 7,000. Again, I have these two points. I want to know the distance between them. I'm going to do the same thing that I have been. Take the absolute value of their difference. Now, be careful here, though, because you're dealing with negatives. So if you got an answer of like 3,000, you messed up on the negatives. Watch. A is at negative 2,000. Minus, you always write a minus, and then your next number is 5,000. And now, be careful, negative 2,000 minus 5,000, if they're both negatives, you really add them together, and that becomes negative 7,000. And now the last thing I do is take the absolute value. So 7,000 is correct, and it makes sense. If I'm down by 2,000 points already, I have to 
earn 2,000 points just to get back to zero. So there's 2,000 already, and now I need to get up to 5,000. So I had to score 2,000 and another 5,000. So all together, I need 7,000 points. That makes sense. Yes, then I will win. I've got a ways to go. All right, does anybody have any questions right now? We're okay? All right, so your homework is on Delta. It should already be live for you there. I am going to hop over and just do a couple of examples. And... Uh, where am I? Here we are. I kind of want to just make sure that I show you a couple of the first type because I'm telling you right now, they're going to come up on your quiz. They're going to come up on your test. Okay, so scroll. You're looking for homework six. So I know as you guys are doing them, these should move to the bottom, but here we are. Homework six, two dash one, real numbers and number lines. So this first one, okay, see how it's got a whole title? This is a computer generated one. So you could keep doing these until you get, you have to get five of them right. All right, it will just keep giving you more of them. Hopefully you get the first five right, right? And then you don't have to do more. But these ones that just say question, you only get two chances on those. And then it's just right or wrong. You don't get to keep doing them forever. All right, so just keep that in mind. So for these, let's look what you need to do. It's gonna give you some number. You have to tell me in the first drop down if it's rational or irrational. So I'm looking at this square root of two. It's not one, by the way. A lot of times kids think that it's one, but one times one is one, not two, right? So the square root of two, it's actually a crazy weird decimal. So I don't know it off the top of my head. So that's how I know that's my signal. Oh, that's irrational. So I'm gonna choose irrational because that's A, and now I have to pick in this drop down box which reason fits this. Okay, so if you look at the five choices, you have three that are talking about decimals. Well, square root of two, why I would pick one of the square root ones, right? I'm not gonna pick a decimal one, I'm gonna pick a square root one. So let's look at the choices for square roots. It is the square root of a perfect square. No, it's not. It's the square root of a non-perfect square. That's why this thing is irrational. Okay, so I'm gonna pick that one. Yes. Get a new one. Let's see what this one. Ooh, oh, see? I told you they were going to try and trick you. Be careful. Look what's going on here. At first, I'm like, okay, this is chaotic, but is it so chaotic that it's going to be irrational or is it rational? Let's see. Well, it doesn't end, right? The other thing I need for this to be irrational is that it can't repeat. I can't be able to rewrite this using bar notation. Can you? Can you write this with bar notation? No, you can't. I know it's only ones and threes, but they are not repeating in the same chunk over and over again. So yes, this is chaos. This is irrational because I have a, let's see. So now I'm gonna pick one of the things that refers to decimals because this is a decimal. It does not repeat or terminate. That's the one I want. So I'm gonna pick that. I'll do one more, but not that one because that's literally the exact same thing. Oops. Ah! Give up. Yes. Um, well, this is kind of the same thing. So if you look, right, I have a decimal that's never ending, never repeating. One to get a. Uh, we did one like that. Okay, here's one, square root of nine, right? I know the square root of nine is three. Nice, easy. So that means it's going to be rational. Why is it rational? Because square root of nine is a square root of a perfect square. That's the one I'm gonna pick. Nine is a perfect square. Okay, and now all of your other ones should be relatively straightforward. It's just, um, I give you the number line and asking you for the lengths, just like we had done in the notes. 
I think there's one or two uh, word problems towards the end, but they should be, yeah, it shouldn't be anything too crazy. So I know we are almost out of time. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to actually stop the video here.